this is Princess Shook, and Shook asks, why did they never make a map like Dark Souls ever again? Because they wanted to make good maps. <laughs> I mean, they're... they're... <laughs> Ooh! <laughs> I'm laughing too because there is some truth to that. Um, you know, oh, Lord, um, honestly, though, I think because of how popular Dark Souls One's map is, I think the reason is more. Hi, Richie. Hi, Sin. Hi, everyone. Today we have a very special podcast with two very special guests. <gasps> Who are they? Introduce yourself, special guest number one. Which one of us is special guest number one? I guess it's you, Redgrave. Hi, uh, I'm Redgrave. I wrote The Pale Blood Hunt, which is probably the thing I'm, I'm most well known for on the internet. I also made some videos, and I basically just know a lot of stuff about Blood. And you know what? I don't want to use special guest number two because it could put someone in second place. So let's say we also have a special guest number A. Introduce yourself. It's Kyan again. Wow. Yeah, we talked about how Kyan is no longer a special guest. It's true. Are we going to ignore the fact that A is not a number? Oh, I see, I see. Redgrave is Team Richie now. Thanks, Redgrave. I didn't say anything. <laughs> no, this, the second you said we only had 90 minutes, I went into, like, teaching class mode. All right. <laughs> I guess I guess since I'm mostly on Patreon content, it seems, I should reintroduce myself as I'm Kyan, the creator of I Want to Be the Guy, which is just a really hard indie game. And, like, every indie dev, um, I have just massive painful love for Dark Souls and everyone's sick of hearing about it, but perfect place to offend some of that. Don't undersell yourself. It's not just a very hard indie game. It's an incredibly good, well-made, and influential indie game. Why, thank you. And, and very funny. Hilarious. Yeah. That's the thing I remember about yeah. it the most, which yeah. I think we went yeah. over when we talked about it. Yeah. I think as a tribute to Kyan, we should have the unregistered Hypercam 2 watermark visible in this video. <laughs> No, no, what you need to have is a giant mouse cursor. <laughs> okay, I can make both happen. Excellent. And Kain mentioned that he's mostly on Patreon. That's because that's where all the trash goes. That, and I am a dumpster fire of trash. <laughs> it's where I belong. <laughs> Thank you. Good lord. I guess the, the other thing we should say about Kyan is you made the Dark Souls map viewer. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. true. Yes, because yeah. I am. Yeah. Thank you for making the obvious connection that I missed. Because <laughs> <laughs> The reason this topic is actually perfect for you. <laughs> You're right. Um, I love maps and games. I love... Um, I, I don't want to say... Because open world games imply something different. Like, you think about, like, uh, Elder Scrolls and stuff like that. Yeah. But, like... Yeah. The, like designerly free flowing maps, like Super Metroid and stuff yeah. like that, or even like Zelda games and stuff yeah. like that, and the way these kind of curated worlds that like you almost build like a like a like a theme park. Like I love them so much, and I would say that like Dark Souls is one of the best executed versions of this. In a mm. When it came out, it was, like, by far the best. And uh, now, I mean, uh, I think, like, Red Grave might argue for uh, Bloodborne a little bit. And you know what? That would be fine. But, like... Well, I, I, I was saying this to Kyan last night. I messaged him because I, I skimmed through the outline that Sin prepared for us. And, I, and I'm afraid that I might come off as, as kind of a buzzkill here. Because I personally don't think there's anything particularly special about Dark Souls 1's map. Um, so, uh, um, my concern is that I'm going to come across as the, the, <laughs> the angry <laughs> black sheep of this podcast, but <laughs> Look, we need a little, we need a little bit of every perspective. That's fine. I guess, sure. Cause I think the important thing too, just to, re just to like realize in the situation is like, 
even though, because I think we were talking last night about the various flaws that we'll get to, it's like, they're all valid. Like, there's nothing you said to yeah. me when we were talking about, I'm like, oh, that's not true. Um, But, like, that map had effects on people, like the feeling that that mm. managed to impart. So there's just a lot of things that make it kind of special. And I think it's just mostly that not a lot of stuff tried to pull off the, I mean, it's weird to call it a Metroidvania, but like people kept using that term because it's just, it's something like it just reminded them of Metroid. Yeah. Yeah, sure. It feels more like a like a console style interconnected world than an enormous Bethesda thing. Oh, yeah, well, it's I enormous Elder it Scrolls. Yeah, um, yeah, like a like a legacy of Kane. Mm, mm, yeah, right. Because some of those early Elder Scrolls ones literally didn't like large chunks of it wasn't actually a map at all. It was just an algorithm that would constantly generate terrain until you. Daggerfall yeah. was most. I want to say like ninety eight percent procedurally generated dungeon crawl. Yeah, uh, Morrowind yeah. was the first one they made that was actually a like a design fully world. authored. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know about Arena. I never played Arena. Daggerfall. Arena. The- Arena was also, I think, mostly procedurally generated. You know, they're, they're seeded worlds. They're consistent for the for every for the context yeah. of everybody who doesn't know. Like they're consistent every time you play them. Uh, in fact, there's no r- randomness in the generation in the CPU, but they were the worlds were generated probably by at the time powerful computers that yeah. uh, put together these randomly yeah. pr- these procedurally generated worlds. Yeah, at the time, Daggerfall was incredibly technically impressive, despite being yeah. very buggy. <laughs> Um, I think da- Daggerfall is like, in terms of actual space, is like it's the size of the British Isles or something. Yes. Uh, it's I, it's I, just that <laughs> it's mostly procedural forest. I can't accurately confirm whether this is true or not, but the statistic yeah. I always saw read was that if you were to walk from one end, like hold down the W key and walk from one end of Daggerfall to the other, it would take about a week of real life time. Yeah, I think it still ranks as like one of the largest yeah. game world maps in existence. Uh, and then you compare that to something like uh, Dark Souls, which, by all comparisons, for a like air quote open world game, is like very small by square like square footage. Uh, well, like, it's it's yeah, tiny. The term open world, the term open right. world has become so muddled. Like when I think of open world, I think of either Morrowind or I think of Grand Theft Auto Three basically, are the two types. When I think of an open-world mm. game, I think of those. Right. Yeah. And then you have this other class where it's like, a lot of times it's just like an open design, an expo- uh, exploratory design just for the sake of making a place feel like a place. Like, right. like the, the Fallout yeah. 2 style map design mm. of a bunch of different areas that have exploratory aspects to them that allow you to maneuver them freely. It's not an open world, it's a series of open areas. Yeah, which is looping back around why when this came out, it it came out around the same time as Skyrim and there were initial comparisons because they're both dark fantasy RPGs, but it's why everyone was saying it was was a Metroidvania, it was a Zelda game, they weren't saying it was Skyrim. Right. Right. Right, which is also interesting because um, unlike all the other Souls games, like, I always say, like, a lot of people think the difference between, like, Metroid and Zelda's perspective. Um, and, and I, well, I mean, like, words mean whatever people mean, but, like, personally, I don't use the terms like that. Like, a Zelda game. Yeah. You mean to perspective me, kind of, as in, as in, side versus top right. down? Yeah. <laughs> right. Like, in a Zelda game, you have this thing of, like, you have a hub area and you have dungeons of independent, completable content that kind of yeah. break off of it in spokes. Mm. Yeah. Uh, which is, yeah. was the most, common model for kind of open 3d games uh back when dark souls 3 came out um not dark souls 3 dark souls 1 um also when dark why. souls 3 came out well yeah it's actually not a lot model. of games <laughs> not a lot of games do this like like off the top of my head like full 3d games it's dark souls and arkham asylum i think are the only ones that are like really metroid in terms of arkham like the Asylum. Way the oh, yeah arkham asylum didn't have a hub though well, right, because that's the Zelda model. Right. I mean, technically, Dark Souls 1 has a hub, but the map design isn't laid out like, like it has a hub. 
There is oh, there's my. multiple mid there's multiple mini hubs. Yeah, it's a s- series of T junctions that branch off in increasing okay, complexity. Okay, sure. Yes, I would right. Because if you look yeah, at Super yeah. Metroid, like every hub in like Super Metroid is every long vertical shaft. Like that's the way the game's structured. Right? You have these long vertical shafts that represent these like four branches of areas where you clear out the, the, all the side content on the side, and then the lowest or highest point on that um vertical column leads you generally speaking to where you have to go next and that's kind of the same way yeah. dark souls works just tilted in, around in 3d yeah sure. yeah I, I was gonna say that that when you were talking about perspective that the big difference to me between metroid and zelda is that metroid has gravity in it um, I know Zelda, obviously, when they went 3D, they added multiple levels, but it's really common in Metroid the for the game to, yeah, to just drop you down a pit. Yes. And you have to get out of that pit, and it might take you, like, it might lead some roles, it might take you a really long time to get out of that pit. It's not really something that happens in Zelda. If you If you hit a dead end in Zelda, it's reasonably easy to turn around and go back again, whereas Metroid is just like... And it's something so many. Sorry, yeah. sorry go ahead. I didn't mean to. Oh, just like if the if that floor collapses, like you are stuck in that pit and you have to climb all the way back out again, and you have no idea if there was anything useful at the bottom. <laughs> yes, yeah. and and it's one of yeah. the reasons why the comparison to Castlevania games was made so often is because Castlevania does the same thing. A Circle of the Moon quite literally begins with you dropping down a pit and having to spend mm. a good. Uh, six or seven hours climbing out of the pit to get back where you started. I have a lot of bad things to say about Circle of the Moon. Circle of the Moon but, is not a great Castlevania but game. That, but it's, that, a, it's a good game. But that starting um, thing of falling down a hole and then that sense of relief hours later when you come out of it is like that's one of those things that like I'm like that really worked. Yeah. Mm. The card system not so much. Yeah. No. <laughs> See, I would say that's a bad game that had good stuff in it, <laughs> but that's what I think that's, not fair. About I think that's a, yeah. I think that's a fair assessment. Yeah, some great boss fights and uh, a few cool old design things. But anyways, so yeah, so you like if you look at like the Dark Souls one design, like you look at the um, big spread map of like. Well, not not the, not the spread out map, the, like the node maps that all the various Souls games people make. Like, oh, this area connects to this area, connects to this area. Um, one thing that's kind of like interesting about um, Dark Souls One is I feel like that structure is very literal in the game. It's the game is basically made out of a lot of linear tracks mm-hmm. um, with not a lot of. Um, you generally don't go off to the side to a big new area. You go off to the side to little little distractions stuff like that maybe when you come back around to an area something that's in the side area might turn out to be a new area you have to go to but generally speaking when you're proceeding through an area you're going to you're just going down a road basically Mm -hmm. that has these side diversions and like if i think about like um how um boletaria is laid out how um the high walls and dark souls 3 are laid out or whatever it's like i i don't feel like they're designed like that like those are some big, easy to get lost in overwhelming areas that are like really cool for that purpose. Um, but areas like that make it hard to um, learn to navigate consistently. Um, so like that's probably part of the trade-off why they haven't done the Dark Souls one model a lot is because you can be like really neat with like really convoluted areas. But uh, Dark Souls one keeps it kind of simple in a way that makes it really easy to work learn the overall world the individual areas become slightly less interesting so that the whole map as a whole gets interesting and i had like these example images of how the framing of the camera and how you proceed through um like the first area the undeg bird basically every time you come into a new screen the camera basically shows you a large landmark of where you're going next that always stays in pretty much in clear sight and it just leads you to the aqueduct Oh, to the bridge, under the bridge. Oh, there's the big tower. Up into the big tower. Oh, there's the yeah. um, there's the church. Up through the church, and it's just like super well laid out. Like every time you come out through a door, there's a just another big vista showing you the next place to go. And 
I think it leads to this thing. Like, I think the thing that people like about Dark Souls 1's map is they feel very comfortable in it. Um, I know, like, it took me much, much longer to feel comfortable running around, um, running around Yarnum. And, and, like, I love Yarnum, especially, like, the actual city parts of Yarnum. But, like, there's still parts now when I go back, it's like, how do I get through the sewer? Like, where does this connect again? Like, it gets, like, kind of brain melty. And that's part of the, the appeal in another way. But it's like, even after years of not playing, like, Dark Souls, I go and play Dark Souls. And it's like, I know how to get everywhere still. Because it's designed in these, like, really digestible chunks with really clear communication of what routes kind of are, what route you're on. So I agree and I disagree. Okay, why do you disagree? So, well, I disagree because I think the reason for that is not because of the map itself. Okay. I think Yarnum, I think Yarnum does everything that Lordran does, and I, in fact, I think it does it better. But I think the main reason you have that understanding of its interconnectivity it's down to lack of fast travel is is due to the fact that you don't get fast travel until you're halfway through the game. And yeah. I think the reason people have this fondness and this memory of the interconnectivity of it, which exists in the other games they've made, um, sometimes to a lesser degree, sometimes to a greater degree, is because in the other games you always have fast travel. You always have the ability to warp around, and it doesn't force you to commit these interconnected pathways to memory in the way that Dark Souls 1 did. See, the thing where I would disagree with that is I look at Yarnum, and I think Yarnum is actually in a lot of ways, uh, again, especially the city part, actually way, way more complicated. And I think that actually, like, if you took fast travel out of... Um, Bloodborne, I think it would just actually just be more frustrating uh, for a lot of people who are learning it because it's really easy to get lost in Yarno. See, I find I find that Yarnum, like the individual chunks of Yarnum, the difference to me between Dark Souls and Bloodborne was that the the individual chunks of Yarnum would have two or three or four different ways of traversing them. Yeah. But you couldn't do the thing that you could do in Dark Souls, where it's like, I'm going to start and I'm going to ignore where I'm supposed to go and I'm going to go around the back of Undead Parish and my first boss is going to be the Bell Gargoyles. You couldn't do things like that. That's, that's fair. Yeah, I think the yeah. appeal of adding fast travel to Dark Souls was because I think they wanted to have these more complicated open areas they wanted to have more local complexity at the expense of more global complexity um yeah. which i think is actually a fair trade-off except for the fact that like i personally love these sort of globally designed maps and they're very rare like if there's a lot of games like this it might be like oh yeah no both are like great because like i love bloodborne and i love dark souls 3 which are very different types of maps from uh dark souls mm. 1 and they and like different ways that have their own individual strengths as well. Like, so yeah, like so like fast travel is a great thing to talk about though, because like when do people say Dark Souls One goes downhill and you get fast yeah. travel? It's more than just the fast travel. The, right. the no, 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 it totally yeah. is. Dark Souls One is is the weak. Why? But, why do people say that? They just don't like the last third of Dark Souls One as much. Uh, it's yeah, it's a like multi- Isolith tomb. Yeah, it's a bunch of really slogging areas. Like it's not like, even the right. Yeah, archives, though. right. The Duke archives is probably the yeah. the, yeah. the I, least I like oppressive. It. I like it mostly because of its weirdness that they yeah. do with yeah. the the first fight against Seath, and then putting you. I, I like it mostly for those reasons, as opposed to the level design. Um, yeah, the, the expansion, I think, really helps because the exact type of area that the end bit of uh, Dark Souls needs is basically like an Ulusil. Yeah, I mean, the DLC mm. for each game, with the exception of Dark Souls 3, the DLC for each game was the best part of that game. Yes. Yeah. Okay, we're at least all agreeing on that one. <laughs> um, okay, now what were we talking about? I just had totally my brain fast destroyed. Travel. Yeah, fast travel. Um, yeah. 
No, you know, we're talking about the other reasons why uh, it sucks. So it's like, yeah. Well, like, the, the, the structure of one, that final chunk doesn't work without fast travel anyway. Oh, yeah, because it would just be, it would just yeah. be tedious. It would be pain in the ass. And also several of those things drop you in a pit that there's no way to get out of unless you walk back out. Right. Again. It's like... Right, yeah. It just the design idea kind of gets a little like, oh, we kind of designed ourselves into a corner at the end. Yeah, it, it turns into the demon soul structure where suddenly yes. this yeah. environment turns into spokes on a wheel right it yeah. becomes it becomes it becomes zelda at the end yeah but that, that, that like first two-thirds really gets people super hard and even when i went back to yeah. it i like there's a lot of things when i replayed dark souls one recently there's a lot of things i didn't like about it as much anymore like it's amazing how much better bloodborne's combat is like just everything about it mm. feels so much better I was still just completely enamored, just like walking around, like oh, everything's so well, like connected. The game just rewards it's you. Better. It's just it's very different. The like Bloodborne is is an action game that they tacked RPG elements on it to make people happy. Oh, but I mean, like I'm, I'm I could probably play Dark Souls too, and I'd probably also be like, oh, this is so much better. Because it's just like just the hit boxes and stuff like that, the sense of connection. Yeah, because um, uh, Dark Souls three, same thing. It's like it, the combat just feels better. Like there's just that added level of polish. Sure, I, I agree with that. Yeah, I think in Dark Souls one, like if you haven't played it for a while, like you can come back at first, be like, "Ooh, the hit boxes on this are a little bit uh, a little bit sketchy." And I think people would say that about the newer games too, but like. Going back, it's like, no, they're way sketchy in <laughs> Dark Souls yeah, 1. Definitely. Not even the, not even the hitboxes, but, like, the actual collision boxes on enemies. Like, the thing I didn't re- remember was really annoying was, like, like running up to, like, Ornstein and trying to hit him and missing because he just kind of, like, turns the skirt, just pushes me away. <laughs> like, it's like, I don't remember that happening at all. But, like, yeah, that, like, map is just, like, um... Real nice through like two thirds of it, and even like, wait, where do I want to go from here? Let me check the outline because I don't want to go in circles. Da, 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 talk about the maps. So I think like Dark Souls Two is kind of interesting because you look at Dark Souls Two's maps, and it's like it's almost like they were kind of like interconnected a little bit, and like had so mm-hmm. many changes of like thought and direction and everything like that because you have like, weird things like how like the lost bastille is kind of a mini hub and stuff like that right yeah yeah it's two ways yeah because there's two ways to get to lost bastille that both take you to a different part of it yeah and they like, never really do that again yeah and like dark souls 3 everything's like completely separated Yahargul uh, yeah kind of does that but it's not the same. oh yeah 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 it's not the same though yeah i think it's like and I, I guess Cathedral Ward as well, because there's the two different paths there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think part of the reason that um, From got away from the, they did the Metroid thing once is, I have a feeling like this doesn't just, it doesn't mesh with how they design content. Because I think we know from like yeah. all the cut content is they're a company that's really good at making a bunch of stuff and figuring out how to make it work later. And like, when well, you Richard, have this like... Sorry, go ahead. Uh, oh. I was just saying, Richard and I, we've talked about this multiple times over the years, but when you look at Bloodborne and you look at Yarnum, it is painfully obvious that they designed the map first and then yeah. plotted out where you go and what is in it afterward. Yeah. And they're, the first thing they did with Bloodborne quite clearly is they built this entire world and then, af- and then the gameplay of it came after the fact. Mm. Yeah. And you can see, like, the way that Yarnum is constructed, it branches off in, like, a wheel as well into all these different directions. To the point where, like, you could actually... I'm not, I'm not saying it was, it was never designed this way, but you could have actually made Erden Chapel the hub and just made you run. And you can get yeah. from Erden Chapel to pretty much anywhere in, like, a couple of minutes. Including the DLC. Yeah. That's true. Right, and it could work in the same way, too, where you have you... you the player could come in from anywhere... And yeah. get to the hub, like when they're originally going to go yeah, through. It, yeah, it's very Demon Souls esque because you have like the the central Yarnum, and then you got like you have Hemwick, and then after Hemwick there is Kanehurst, and you've got Forbidden Woods. After Forbidden Woods is Bergen. Yeah, and it's if, like laid out like that. And yeah. if you wanted to move any of those outward areas someplace else, like if you wanted to move Hemwick yeah. somewhere, something like that, 
like yeah. that, like it'd be so easy. Yeah. To but just, also, did. but <laughs> also the burn <laughs> wood. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Oh, it's going to say they did because we have like the early development maps and like they were. They were rotating everything around, like they were rotating. That makes a lot of sense because constantly, yeah. When I was looking through the uh, the maps for uh, for uh, Bloodborne, I was noticing a lot of things, like like where coastlines would be and stuff, not quite lining up. And I, the feeling I had was yeah. like, it feels like they rotated a bunch of stuff because <laughs> it, it, yeah. it felt close ish, but like not quite right. It's like ah, oh, that makes sense that they like probably yeah. started off and then like okay, hacked it up, okay. There's a little bit of fudging with the space, um, right? The, and I mean, even in even in, little yeah. fudge. even in Dark Souls, there's a little bit of fudging. Like you can look at a few areas where, like, the Tomb of the Giants, like you should be able to fall into Quaylog's domain and stuff like that. Like it's close. Like not not yeah. a lot of stuff completely overlaps. Like they're pretty honest, but like it's not as bad as Dark Souls Two, which is the worst in that aspect. Oh yeah, like Dark yeah, Souls absolutely. Two was yeah. so bad that uh, like when I got to Dranglet, I'm like, I feel like I should be in, like I literally had that feeling there. I'm like, this would overlap something. Like this isn't right. And I look at the Matthew, and I'm like, oh, it literally does when you yeah. if you if you zoom if you were to zoom out all the way and and. Like multiple sections of that game's map quite literally do overlap on Yeah, that. right. Like it's not a problem if stuff overlaps if nobody can tell. Right. Like Fair. I would almost say like Dark Souls One yeah. is a little too honest. Like it, it had room to cheat a little bit more if it wanted to. But like Dark Souls Two was enough for me to just playing the game like this is wrong. <laughs> like, yeah. Most obvious part of two is um the elevator to the to ground volcano. level volcano. Yeah, that the, one. Yeah. Elevator up from the windmill into the volcano. Yeah. That's that's probably the most egregious example. Yeah, and that's extremely I, I remember people people trying to defend that by drawing these like Wily e. Coyote style plants <laughs> of like, no, it's actually it's going this way and it's blocked by this thing and the elevator actually goes sideways here and it's like just no, it, it's no, a, it's the just, Wonka Vader. It. It's all good. Yeah, <laughs> I guess that that brings up something that you mentioned with regard to Dark Souls One, which is that you can see the areas you're going to. Oh yeah. Whereas in Dark Souls Two, you almost never see where you're going. It blindsides you with not not just new areas, but entirely new biomes kind of out of nowhere. Yeah, yeah. yeah the thing that gets me And I know people who yeah. I know people who prefer that, who say like they actually like that better because you sort of don't really know what is coming. It, it's constantly throwing new things at you. It works well in a few areas in Dark Souls 2. The moment where you come up and you arrive at the dragon area, I think is a great oh, moment yeah. of that. But the moment where you go up from the elevator in the windmill and come out of an active volcano, not so much. Because it and kind of, it, it, it's too much. <laughs> you know, it, it's hard to justify in a way that keeps you immersed in the world's geography. And you can always do both. I mean, that is kind of like when you go to, like, on Orlando. It's like the same thing. Like, whoa, yeah. what the hell? It's, it's a trick they only pull once, but like... You know, it works for you when you go down and you like walk out and it's the demon ruins and it's like, oh wow, everything's just lava now. Like, what? It's and not I quite the same. I think part of that had to do with the fact that with Dark Souls 2, they wanted it to be an, a more epic scale. They wanted you to be, because there's that map in Majula of Drang Lake. And the idea is that the game takes place over an entire continent. Yeah. And they want you to be traveling over this entire continent and going to all these regions. But what that ends up doing is having you take a bunch of elevators through impossible space that can't be explained. Yeah, and it's, like, weird, because, like, there's also parts where it's, like, I remember always looking at the, um, what's the, um, what's the first area in, um, Dark Souls 2 that isn't the, uh, forest? The Untended Grave? Oh, no. paid. No, no, the, 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 ta the Tower of Flame. Yeah, the Tower of Flame, like, yeah. you look at that from the yeah. water, it's, like, yeah. in the middle of the ocean, and there'd be no way to get to it. Yeah, you can see it from <laughs> yeah. Jula, like, and but, but like way, it's nonsensical, way, way, way off in the distance, and then you go through a, a short hop through a tunnel, and you're there. Yeah, and there's like no connect, nothing connected to it. So it's just like a lack of like, I don't want to say like care, because it's just like you know, all games are held back by the time and money, but like, um, Kyan, if you didn't know, it had a pretty rough development. Yeah, I think right. Dark so, Souls Two does its best. Dark Souls, right. so I don't want to. Is a masterpiece for the for 
in relative to its development. The fact that that game out game came out, and the fact that that game was great, which people like to shit on it for the fact that it's some people argue it's the weakest of the five. The uh, that that's that's a really good game, and the fact that that game came out and was really good when you do some research and learn about that game's development is really yeah. impressive. I feel like. Dark Souls 2 is going to do better over time because I feel like one of the things is... Oh, it absolutely has already. Right, because I think like when Dark Souls 2 came out, it's like people wanted more Dark Souls 1, and I think it's clear now Mm. that like you're not getting more Dark Souls 1 anytime soon, so you just have these all these different types of takes. So it was like the same thing. Like When I played Dark (laughs) Souls 3, like I didn't get Dark Souls 1 feels from Dark Souls 3, but I was already used to playing all these other games that didn't give it to me, so I was like, oh yeah, Dark Souls 3 is cool. Like... Like, this game's great. So I feel like if I went back to two, now that I'm already over, like, not getting more Dark Souls 1, I'd be like, oh, this is just a solid game with a few things that annoy the crap out of me. Because it's just my Hmm. particular bugbear. (laughs) Yeah. I played Dark Souls after playing Bloodborne, so I kind of went Bloodborne, Dark Souls 3, Dark Souls 2, Dark Souls 1. And I love Dark Souls 2 the best. And then my boyfriend informed me that it's the worst. And I was very perplexed by that. What did you? What did you? What made you like it the most? It's just I think visually it's like my favorite, and also just gameplay wise. It definitely has the best multiplayer out of any of the games they yeah. ever made. Like, and that's and the not a yeah. controversial most thing. flexible. Most flexible builds as well. Yeah, absolutely. Like it's it's the most replayable for me because you if you can come up with an idea for a character, it's probably viable. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I think it also has the. I remember in <laughs> oh in, in Dark Souls one, I tried dual wielding Cestuses because I thought it was a cool idea, and it's it's like useless outside of being a weird gimmick. But then in two, no, it gives you a whole new boxing moveset and everything. And then in, in the DLC even improved upon that, where they gave you the the Tekken moveset with that. I forget the name yeah. of the weapon, but... Yeah, yeah. And, oh, wow. And my my key character in Dark Souls 2 was was that Tekken moveset with the, the turtle shell and the dragon head, and I, I played as Bowser Mishima. <laughs> and, and I just went around <laughs> breathing fire on people and doing Tekken juggles on them, and I did that for weeks at a time, and like <laughs> The build variety and the PvP and the co-op with the all of the co-op stuff in Dark Souls 2 is amazing. Uh, yeah. On release, it was not great because it was very buggy yeah. and it was it had a lot of problems. So the Dark Souls 2 co-op stuff and the Blue Sentinel stuff on release was not great, but it got fixed over time. Yeah, that bums me out because um, I haven't re- I haven't gone back to. Dark Souls 2 ever. I never even did the DLC, which is apparently like did the you best play content. Of the first gen? No. I I'm you gonna get that. I'll get to it you eventually. But yeah, so I played it at its worst and I it didn't drive me to want to replay it at the time. And I feel like that's a game at some point where I owe a in-depth replay of, especially if just only for the uh, DLC. Anyone but, out uh, there who played Dark Souls 2 but didn't play Scholar of the First Sin, with the exception of some of the story stuff, which I think they bungled pretty significantly with Scholar of the First Sin, um, the gameplay of Dark Souls 2, a lot of the complaints people had and a lot of the problems people had with Dark Souls 2, a lot of that is fixed and is incredible with Scholar of the First Sin. Yeah. So anybody out there who hasn't played Scholar of the First Sin but played Dark Souls 2 and was kind of not feeling it, I highly recommend picking up Scholar of the First Sin and giving it a try. Another thing Scholar of the First Sin does, which is, I think, tying back into what we're talking now, is it it mixes up the progression as well. Yeah. Because one of the issues with the people had with Dark Souls 2 was that you'd start and Majula connected to a bunch of places, but you could only actually go to two of them initially. But Scholar does break that up and it makes it a lot easier to like you can do the pit early like much much easier than you could oh, cool. beforehand you yeah and like it, it gives you an extra unpetrifying branch right. at the start so you can head directly to the shaded woods and things like that it really it also just moves where keys and things are and it just completely changes the way you move through that game yeah it moves all of the enemy placement it it puts yeah. mo- it puts mobs in different places it removes the the bizarre placement of some of the enemies and it fixes them and it, it, it scholar of the first sin is is one of the best repackagings of a game 
in terms of fixing a lot of its core problems that I've ever seen. Yeah. Especially with the DLC added, which is incredibly, like, yeah, incredibly the DLC good stuff. Yeah, is some of the best level design that From Software has yeah, ever Yeah, that's done. what I kept hearing from everybody. And I think the other thing that's, like, nice about, like, Dark Souls 2, like, if we're talking about, like, local level design, like, I feel like Dark Souls 2 has the best, like, biome diversity of yeah. any Souls game by, like, a lot, actually. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, sure, I would agree. Another th- th- another thing about the level design in 2, especially the DLC, is that it's really good. It's also just completely abstracted out by the time of the DLC. Because there's, like, like Broom Tower, mm-hmm. the Iron King yeah. DLC. Like, that is an incredible level. That is, you have to, like, light flames to make things move up. Now yeah. you're actually changing the geometry of the level as you go through it by making these huge pillars go up and down. But... Like, it in no way resembles anything that would actually exist in the real world. Yes. At all. Uh, agree. Yeah. Whereas, and, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, 100%. And the thing that yeah. I have such a fondness for and a love for Demon Souls is that everything in Demon Souls feels like it's a place that people could actually live and work. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, like it's shortcuts in Demon Souls. They're not elevators. They're not conveniently locked doors. They're castle gates or water wheels or stuff that could actually exist in the real world. And it's grounded in such a way that makes it feel like a real place. Whereas Dark yeah, Souls and there's, goes there's huge in the opposite direction. <laughs> yeah, and like there's chunks of Demon Souls that are just sort of like there. They don't really do anything, but they make the world feel more solid and yeah. real because it's like oh yeah this would be here like sure. there is just a room where the knights had dinner and there is just stables and things that don't actually serve a yeah, game like, of purpose, course there would be a dining yeah. hall for the knights they need to eat somewhere yeah. right like yeah yeah it's funny how that just slowly fades because you see a little bit of that like early on in uh dark souls one like there's a few rooms in mm. like Undeadburg where it's like, what yeah. the hell is yeah. this? But then again, there's also rooms in Undeadburg where it's like, it's just an empty room with it's like, like dirt. A trap room. Like there are a it's lot of monster room. closets in Dark Souls One. Yeah. yeah. All of Low- Lowerburg, basically. Yeah. Nobody actually yeah. lived here. Yeah. <laughs> All of Lower Undeadburg is just a series of monster closets. Like mm. Yeah, it's interesting. You get a, you get actually a widespread of like level design philosophy if you look at from software's work yeah. like from abstract to realistic to like the metroidvania to the zelda e they're yeah surprisingly flexible with that yeah i mean people like to talk about how the games are all similar and how strange it was that sekiro was so different but it's like no they have a lot of different ideas that they just put mm. this shell around like yeah. they put the whole shell around a different concept for a game excuse me yeah, like, um, we talked about, like, uh, uh, nothing to do with this, we talked about how, like, I think all of their PS1 games, so that's, like, Armored Core Kingsfield mm-hmm. Echo Knight, they all seem to be running on the exact same engine. But it's, like, this fantasy RPG, this mecha game, and this what's basically a point-and-click adventure. You would, but they're all running on the same engine. You would know this, I don't know this. Does 4 Answer run off the same engine as... Any of the Souls games? I don't think it does. Yeah. It well, f- yeah. For answer is like that was a PS. I know, like, fr- yeah. Fr- from have an in-house engine that I think they just sort of use chunks off for everything. But like, I for answer is so unlike anything in terms of how it plays. Yeah, I just that's yeah. just something I don't know and I never looked up. But I figured you know way more about Armored Core than I do, so I figured. <laughs> Armored Core, again, is a game that, like, when I, this showed up when I streamed it, but there's whole chunks of that game that, like, you have to go into the old underground wartime shelters, kind of like mm-hmm. like the yeah. Fallout Vault things. And, again, it's like, yeah, and it's like no exaggeration to say that, like, 75% of those maps have nothing in them. Yeah. It's just like, this is a big underground storage facility, so it's just going to be a huge... It's a bunch of rooms yeah. connected by elevators. We never put and anything in them. Yeah, there's nothing in them. Yeah, not a and great if you go and look in all of them, honest. like there's not yeah. a lot of things being stored. <laughs> yeah, and if you if you go and and start trying to find what's in every single one of them, you'll just get whittled down by all the little drones and things that are guarding them. 
There's a great uh, there's a great design philosophy in one of the the A D and D books. I, I couldn't tell you offhand which one it is, but it's it's this idea for a GM should never put an empty room for their adventurers to explore because by the end of the day they will have taken apart every brick in search of the hidden. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this this is what happened to me when I tried to play Elder Scrolls because one of my friends gave me a copy of Oblivion in like 2011 or something, and because I had grown up on console with Zelda. They'd be like, oh, where are you? And I'd say, oh, I'm in the forest at the start and I'm looking for stuff. And it's like, no, move on. No, 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 no. I'm looking in the forest. There's got to be a secret here. And I was combing every single little cave and <laughs> under every rock yeah. thinking, because I'm in Zelda headspace thinking, well, they must have put something here. Yeah. Oh, that's the awesome. There's got to be coming. like, there's going to be a warp tile around yeah, here somewhere. Yeah, the, the idea is you should never put an empty room in your dungeon because by the end of the night, your adventure or your party, they will have used all of their spells Taken up yeah. every brick, and they'll be have whittled down everything just in an attempt to find what secret you have placed in the empty room. <laughs> yeah, and sin, sin. This happened to me in Fallout Three as well. Yeah, you told me you were like, "Oh, yeah. I saw this electrical station, and I explored it." Yeah, and then five minutes yeah. later, I saw another one. That I mean, to be fair, yeah. that was a problem that some of those later Elder Scrolls games have. Uh, Skyrim in particular has that problem with all of the Draugr caves that are there. Yeah, there's another one. Yeah. Okay, but that's a Skyrim problem. Fallout is perfect. Fallout is perfect. No, but the specific thing with Fall the specific thing with Fallout is that the power station was like an important location in Fallout 2. So when I found it, I'm like, oh, I I know where this Fallout is going. Is this is gonna be very important. Yeah, like this is this is going to be an incredibly important location. I'd better scour it from head to toe, and there was nothing there. So well, I thought, Richard, I'll mark it on my map like and come back problem. later. <laughs> yeah, it is a me problem. I'm aware of this. Okay. Yeah. Guess what cup I'm drinking out of? Sippy cup? A uh, Bruitus? <laughs> Jesus, no! It's a, it's a Fallout mug I got in the loot crate. Yeah. What if you drop it? I, I'm not going to drop it. That's the only mug in my life I will not drop. I will break all my boyfriend's mugs, but this one, no. Yeah. 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 See, what you need is just a crash sound effect after you say that you won't drop it. <laughs> <laughs> I have the little slug who cannot lie mug right, with me yeah. right now. Yeah. I'm drinking lukewarm flat Pepsi out of it. I think my general experience with From Software games is always, I have a whole bunch of problems, but despite all of them, I enjoyed myself a lot. Except for Demon yeah. Souls, which is perfect. Well, yes, obviously. that's an, that's 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 not true. Never did anything wrong. No, Demon Souls is perfect and completely airtight, and definitely can't be broken by with the slightest breeze. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go to the angelic outline. Oh. Well, she does have an angelic outline sound effect, but sometimes it doesn't play, and I'm supposed to know that yeah. before it doesn't play yeah. and do do the yeah. sound effect for it. I should yeah. listen to more of your podcast because I, I keep missing these references. Oh my god, yes. The best ones are Bergenworth. Don't say Reborn. Three hours later. There's also Choir Intelligence at Edgar. The character with no dialogue that you managed to get like an hour out of, and you just leave yourself in eating soup. Well, Edgar, Edgar, <laughs> that one I can see because Edgar has room for exploration despite having no dialogue. That one, that one I can okay, but it it ends up with me reading self published werewolf erotica. That was a good no, episode. That's just that's just Thank that's you. just the cherry on top. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, questions. <laughs> um. 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 So let's scroll down. So yeah, I asked okay. on Discord if people had any questions for this podcast, and they did. De Peace and Corn asks: Was there any alternative progression paths than we originally had at launch? For example, Hemwick for Bloodborne was originally set up to introduce the character to Yarnum instead of waking up in it. This is obviously referring to Dark Souls map progression. Not that I know of, but you would probably know more than I would. Uh, Illusionary Wall put out a video kind of that kind of covered some of this recently, talking about like 
an alternative route to the undead berg that was apparently not the aqueducts, that the aqueducts would probably be a shortcut that you opened up later. I'm like, oh, huh. But I think in general, it's yeah. like when you make a, a map, like a Metroidvania style, whatever, it's really hard to change things up. Like you have some options, but like you have a yeah. lot less of them. Yeah, and which like Dark Souls 2 sort of demonstrates because they did change that up and you realize that these areas are overlapping each other and nothing makes sense anymore. And as an aside, for people who are interested in this topic of map design in the Souls games, Illusory Walls videos are all very, oh, they're a very good place. For, yeah, to very good. Yeah. Like Someone who manages to find the unique properties of every different map viewer and makes use of all of them. Yeah, very, very good resource for people who are interested in learning more about the stuff we've been talking about over the past 45 minutes. I, yeah, I always get cracked up when he'll use my map viewer just because there's like a few things about it, like how I o overlap uh, Ulasil and uh, Darkroot Garden. It's just like, God, there's so many better map viewers, but I guess, yeah, okay, I guess I am the only map viewer that actually does that. Like, uses every possible <laughs> tool to make a, make a point, like, very <laughs> thorough. I still can't believe mine's relevant anymore. Go to Noclip, everybody. Oh. Noclip's the best website. It's a good website. The um, only alternative progression path I can think of is that it looks like um, this possibly never made it past concept stage, but the painted world is internally called the Asylum. Mm. So it's possible that you may have started in the painted world to begin with instead of the, that was like an original asylum and they that just would recycled make it a lot to of make Ariana. So I have, yeah. I've heard that before. And the explanation that I came to was that it, the term asylum was referring to it being a prison specifically for Priscilla. Yeah. Something like that. But like at this point, the, the, Priscilla was the fire yes, keeper. Yeah, sure. Type. Like it's it's all over the place. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you, Richie. Can you read the next question? Art divinator Aki asks, "What's your thoughts on if we were going to enter an Orlando from ground level in some earlier stage of development? I'm guessing meaning um, the, the path like the thing, yeah. up thing after after sense. Yeah. I kind of would have liked that. Yeah." Well, they did that in Dark Souls 3. Yeah. Yes, they did. Yeah. Yeah, it just felt weird. It, like, you had this whole game where, like, you could walk anywhere, and that was, like, the one area where it's like, well, no, you kind of got to get carried. Yeah, it, it, it's it's yeah. kind of a bummer that, that Sin's Fortress and, and Orlando don't connect fluidly. Mm. Yeah, like, uh, it would be cool if... You had to, like, you did the gargoyles up once just so you got that cool shock reveal, and then later you open up a gate or something. Like, yeah. I don't know. It's a minor in, thing, but it's the type of thing I like. Because they did the same thing in Demon Souls with uh, 3-1 and 3-2. Oh, and yeah, in that, yeah. In that case, it was done for technical reasons, because they needed a loading screen for 3-2, because it was the largest and most um, asset-heavy zone in that game the three and twos they, are ridiculous yeah. and they simply they simply could not the, you, you they simply did not have the technological ability to have that flow open to it so they needed a loading screen um and i don't know if that was also the i i, I don't know if that's also the case with an orlando but it, it i i do remember being slightly disappointed that for a game that was designed to be free-flowing there's that very awkward jump cut between Sen's Fortress and Anne Orlando. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Beautiful Bear in a Tutu asks, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on the Master Key and whether you'd like a similar mechanic to return in future From games. No. Wow. No, the Master <laughs> Key is awful. Yeah, I love it's it. Awful. It's terrible. Love it's it. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Master Key Prosecution, go. Um, <laughs> Master Key is part of a larger issue that Dark Souls 1 has, and it's one of the larger issues that it has that they addressed and fixed and made better in future games, which is it's the way it gates progression was difficult for a lot of players who were new to that type of genre to understand and to get around, and it's the reason why a lot of players initially got turned off by Dark Souls 1. When you look at the graveyard skeletons, a lot of players were incredibly frustrated by that because they didn't understand that that wasn't the place you were supposed to go. 
because it was gated so obscurely by the fact that you needed a blessed weapon in order to pass through it, which is such an abstract concept that isn't ever really talked about in the game. Similarly, so people talk about how when you start in Firelink Shrine, you can go in any direction. And it's like, yes, but on your first playthrough, that you can't because you don't have the information required to pass through it. You don't have the understanding of how the game works. So you have to go to Undead Berg first. But I know multiple people who have said that they played Dark Souls 1, they tried to get through the graveyard into the, the underground, and they just kept dying to these skeletons, and they said, fuck it, and they refunded the game. And they fixed that in Dark Souls 2, because with Dark Souls 2, when you have Hyde's Tower of Flame, you have these giants in a ton of armor, and you go there and you go, okay, I'm not supposed to be here, um, right? Because you, it's just an enemy type that you look at and you go, I'm not supposed to be here. But with Dark Souls 1, they had a lot of issues with that, and in, with New Londo also, where Dark Souls 1, the beginning of Dark Souls 1, and the way you're supposed to progress is linear, but it gives you these options of non-linearity that ends up making it confusing for a lot of new players. I just want to say that I did Hyde's Tower of Flame first, and I didn't know there was any other option. Yes, yeah, same. <laughs> well, th- I didn't say they f- were perfect. I said that they got better. Thank you, Redgrave. Master Key Defense. Now. Um, I will say that it might not be the best <laughs> idea to have it as a starting gift type setup, especially since I think the starting gifts in general are terrible. Kind of, yeah, it's a confusing concept and it makes players feel like, oh God, I'm fucking up. Like, it, gives really, you, it gives you an anxiety over importance. Uh, it gives an impo- it gives a weight to something that has absolutely no weight. Right. But to throw an item somewhere or an ability that allows you to blow up in the game and get yourself into trouble, That's I think great. it's great. Right. Because um, the comparison I wanted to make, which I think is a better version of this, is wall jumping in Super Metroid. Yeah, absolutely. Where That's wall great. jumping, you just break the game. Like yeah. you want, you go yeah. wherever you want, like whatever. Yeah. When you, but it's when you such a gated so me- it's form, and it unlocks an entirely new area. Uh, that's great. Master key, not a good example of that. See, I would say, but I, I do think the things it allows is good. But uh, I think at the same time, you can criticize how it's given to the player. Terrible, because starting gifts are terrible. Terrible. Um, yeah, and uh, that would be my only real complaint about it. And I think if they did it again, they should do it in a smarter way. Sure, have it have it be a reward for a boss kill. I, I like the idea of hide it somewhere super obscure that you get told about later in the game, but that when you replay the game, you, always you know, like, oh, I know this now, so I can use my prior knowledge. Yeah. That would be cool, too. Right, there's other ways to do it. So my experience with the Master Key is, like, I agree starting gifts are not good, but I like the way that the Thief class starts with the Master Key, even if you don't take it as a as a starting gift, because it makes it feel like, okay, the because in RPGs generally, like, the Thief doesn't, in this sort of game, doesn't do a lot of stuff that's, like, thievery, it just means they're a dex yeah, build. Yeah, right. Mm. But yeah, but in Dark Souls, like if we ignore starting gifts, the thief starts with the master key. So when I play as a thief, it actually changes up the progression because I can lock it. That'd be interesting if they did more with it. Like it's yeah. a little weird because it's the one example where that's kind I of true. I was about to say that would be more interesting if all of the other classes had their own things that they started with that allowed. Mm-hmm. Even then, I would argue, or even if it's just more than one class, like if there's yeah. like one or yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm. It, it feels more incidental. But like, yeah, but yeah, I do think that is a cool aspect to bring up. I forgot all I for, I totally forgot that the thief starts with it. I think they patched it in later on. Like initially, the thief started with it, and if you weren't the thief, you had to buy it from Domnal. Yeah, and then they patched that it in right as a to me. selectable. Yeah, but I couldn't, yeah, I couldn't tell you if that's exactly how it was, but that sounds like it should be right. Yeah, it it reminds me like we've talked a bit about like the economics of Kingsfield a bit. Yeah. Cause Kingsfield makes a big deal out of like keys and single use items that maybe have one or two utilities to it. Kingsfield is you have to be possibly ridiculous like that. Yeah. So you have to really think about like 
am I going to, like, if I, you know, if I take this rhombus key, it's actually going to change the way I progress through this dungeon. So I like the idea of the thief sort of working like that. I would not mind a return in general of the preposterous level of um, resource inequality of fucking Kingsfield 2, yeah. where it's like, oh, here's I a sword. How much is the it. sword worth? Oh, it's like 300,000 gold. It's like, how much yeah. gold do I have already? Like 20. <laughs> like, yeah. It's like, how do I get 300,000 gold? It's by selling the things that give me permanent stat boosts. <laughs> yeah. So it's like an actual serious decision yeah. you have to make. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Richie, next question. Okay, there was there was more to Bear's question. Okay, Richie. Sorry, I totally interrupted that with my disdain for the master key. <laughs> <laughs> okay, beautiful Bear in a tutu also asks. How do you feel about interstitial paths such as Valley of the Drakes? Do you feel like there's enough in terms of atmosphere and gameplay to make those areas work on their own, or do you think they just function as a means of keeping the world connected? Both? Yeah, I don't know. It's like, they're fine. I think it's good to have areas that are like that, and you can give them cute little names and everything like that, and it's fine. Like, I don't think it hurts anything by being there. It has a little bit more... uh, of a lorzy feeling by having its own theme with the drakes down there and stuff like that. And it's just like a nice, simple yeah. little thing. And sometimes and it's that's something okay. that like, and like, I remember when I, when it clicked for me, how that was all connected. That's when I realized, Oh, you don't even need the master key to do black town first. Yeah. You can just kill Ingvard and drain yeah. New Londo and just run through the Valley of Drakes. Yeah. Well, and that's how, you know, the 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 revelation this you know the secret ending of Dark Souls One is based on the player discovering that you can you can do New Londo at any point in time. Yeah, yeah. Just kind of kill this nice old man. All good. Oh, well, he drowned a city. I don't think you have to do that to get to cough. Do you? But you have to. No, you just have to show him the covenant of. Oh no, you have no, to you show him the, the Lord, Lord vessel. vessel. Right. You yeah. Do. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, he he drowned a city. It's okay. Yeah, no, he's he's not a great guy. Yeah, true. Although, yeah, to be fair. fair, in his defense, now I'm not going to defend the use of overwhelming force, but there was a terrible army of dark wraiths crawling out of the city. Hmm. Speaking of which, what's a lord vessel? Three hours later, can you use it as an ice cream bowl? Yeah, why not? I, I think it's more like it's more like a juicer. Oh. You put the Lord Souls in it, and it it like powers up. <laughs> Can you imagine like an infomercial, and they're like putting Lord Souls in it and turning it on, and then the door opens. Like, wow. Oh my God, Richard, did you just have a vision? We'll talk about it. Later. I think you did. I'm so proud of you. Okay, thank you, everyone. Yeah. Um, next question. Uh, this is Princess Shook. And Shook asks, why did they never make a map like Dark Souls ever again? Because they wanted to make good maps. <laughs> I mean, they're... they're <laughs> Ooh. I'm laughing too, because there is some truth to that. Yeah. Oh, Lord have mercy. Um, honestly, though, I think because of how popular Dark Souls 1's map is, I think the reason is more it's a pain in the ass. Um, but they definitely lead into the advantage, advantages that come with not making that type of map. They try and make it up elsewhere. So, I would say that like the map of Sekiro is actually sure. pretty interconnected. Oh, I'm, it's just I'm that, excited. Yeah, and if you, but be, what I my issue is that because the primary method of traversal in Sekiro is being Spider Man and just pirouetting through the air constantly. I didn't have a sense of how it actually fitted together until I, like, forcibly made myself zoom out and think about it. And then I realized, oh, yeah, this isn't just a bunch of weird spokes like uh, Dark Souls 2. This is actually, everything is emanating from the one point. It's really well designed. There is this, like, giant waterfall and all the streams in the game are you actually going further down the waterfall yeah. and it's pooling oh, at the bottom cool. and all these caves and valleys and everything's connected. Very much. Yeah. 
that took me until New Game Plus Four to realize. And I think oh, that's because frustrating. yeah, I think what this hits on <laughs> was kind of my thought, which is like they did make maps like Dark Souls again, like Yarnum and Sekiro's map, but Bloodborne and Sekiro's maps are like Dark Souls. But what they didn't do is they didn't do the same gameplay progression loop as they did in yeah. Dark Souls One. They never did that again. Um, but yeah, and like, maps uh, like uh, and we. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and like we know from looking at the Bloodborne cut stuff that there were a bunch of other progression paths in Bloodborne initially that they ended up scrapping. Yeah, like the door, be- like the famous thing being the door behind the cleric beast, like that. That yes, was exactly. the way you got in. There were going to be the two ways in. It was actually, from what we can tell, it was going to lead to two different scenarios based on the door that you took. It would change up what was happening in Cathedral Ward when you got there, and. Um, they it just doesn't work. Right. I, I I know because I've seen I've seen people try to run it and like the you fall through the floor like it, yeah. it just wouldn't load properly. Yeah, yeah so nice. I, things like that. I think they did make maps like Dark Souls One again, but they didn't make gameplay like Dark Souls One again. Yeah. And so I think a lot of the affinity people have when they talk about Dark Souls One's world and Dark Souls One's map is I think what they really want is that progression path and that exploration path again uh, and not specifically the map. yeah but even then like talking like i can't talk about sekiro but like talking about like bloodborne ha- spending some time looking through the maps and how it's all connected and stuff like that like um there's still a, like that is less of a tangled mess mess by a lot than like dark souls one making a yeah. map again like yeah. dark souls one especially because of how vertical it is i think that's another like key factor is that mm-hmm. verticality like yarnum mm-hmm. has some vertical verticality but again it's very local you're not like intersecting all these areas that are far off from one another Mm -hmm. and i think it's when you start doing that where you start getting into situations where it's like oh god if only we had a little bit more space and we could cheat a little bit you're just giving yourself headaches yeah i think the only thing like that that like um i might be wrong on this but the only thing i can think about that in yarnum where i had like a what really moment is when you come back up the back of yosefka's clinic it's like yeah it's like Uh, what (laughs) It's fudged a little bit. Um, it does, hmm. for the most part, line up when you yeah. overlay yeah. map on one another, but it is it is fudged just a little bit. Yeah, that's um, fine. But for the most part, it is it is accurate. Yeah, but they tried to keep things kind of separate, except for that core area. It was like a mini, like Yarnum itself has like a gameplay area is like a mini Dark Souls one. Which yeah. is why, like, I think as as far as like individual areas go in Souls games, the, the city of Yarnum as just that area is probably my favorite area in any Soulsborne game. Yeah, I think I like it more. I think it's tighter. Like, I think they cut out the Valley of the Drake style stuff in Dark Souls One, mm. or I'm sorry, in Bloodborne, and they just had it a bit tighter. Like the the progression it's a between lean game. And Old Yarnum, I think is great. I think coming out yeah. of Hargul, fighting Parl, and opening the door, and you're in the other end of old Yarnum, and that's how you can manage to talk to Jura and actually ally with him, and the only way to do that is by going around like that. That's it. I think it's really tight and really awesome. Blood you want, you want to know something game. about that? Oh, yes. That was one of the last things they did. <laughs> From the map, like it, it did not occur to them until really late on that old Yarnum and Yahogol should connect at all. Yeah. There's like a handwritten, literally written by hand, saying maybe we should connect to this. <laughs> <laughs> like after they made, which is why like the the uh, owns- geometry of old Yarnum kind of doesn't make sense from some angles. Yeah, old Yarnum is. I'm trying to think. I think old Yarnum is uh, other than the the nightmare regions, which are nonsensical on purpose. Um, Old yeah. Yarnum is the one that is kind of the, the, this doesn't quite line up. Yeah. The only other parts that like don't line up, I'm doing air quotes so you can't see, uh, is when you have a distant view of Yarnum and you can see that you're seeing it from an angle you shouldn't see it from. Yeah. But other than Same that, it's like, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Shea Pablo asks if you think there's any connection between like the verticality of where the different lords and characters in Dark Souls One are placed and their sort of position in the in the scheme of things in the cosmos. Yes, absolutely. Um, and this is something yeah. that Miyazaki has a fondness for, um, and uh, he goes into this more in Dark Souls Three and a lot more in Sekiro, 
which is the concept of power flowing downwards and pooling in the bottom. Um, Mm -hmm. Which is that the source of power is up above and then it flows down. And this is a very uh, sort of Japanese take on the flow of... uh, I'm trying to think of a word for it because I'm not an expert on Japanese spirituality. But the, the way that power flows like a river... Um, sometimes literally, yeah. sometimes metaphorically, and that it begins from up above and then it flows downward and it pools and stagnates in the bottom. And that's a theme that that Miyazaki, Hidetaka Miyazaki, is clearly a fan of because he includes yeah. it in Dark Souls 1, he includes it in Bloodborne, he includes it in Dark Souls 3, he very much includes it in Sekiro. The position of the lords, the position of Nito as being in the bottom, the position of the Witch of Izalith as being in the bottom, and the position of Gwyn ostensibly being on the top, although he's not, obviously. Yeah, he's actually in the bottom. Right, exactly. Yeah. He's in the bottom. And that's also yeah. very important. The fact that Gwyn is also in the bottom is the fact that the... And this is, you know, uh, this is certainly not unique to Japan. You, you, all you have to do is look at uh, Western philosophy and, and Christianity to, to see that the great things are up above, on high and then the, the, the bad things are down below. You look at Greek mythology, yeah. it has the same thing. Um, this is a concept that's kind of inherent to religion and folklore, um, is this idea that power, that, that things that are great and good and on high are up above where the sun is, and things that are bad and, uh, and wicked and, and corrupted and rotten are down below where the dirt and the mud and the insects writhe. Yes. Okay. Does anybody have anything to add? I think that was a great answer. Excellent. Richie, could you please read the next question? So Princess Capitilla has a question that is similar to the second part of Shea Pablo's question, so we'll do them together. And that is, do you interpret that traveling through the Great Hollow is essentially traveling through a literally condensed space? Like that the tree itself is a portal through space. When we look back up the tree, it's much, much taller than the space we actually uh, traverse, and it rises out of sight into the clouds. Or is that just an example of a gameplay story resource conservation thing where they've just made the tree look bigger from from outside? It's game design. (laughs) So, yeah, I, I, I agree that it's the latter, that it's most likely game design, but I think you could definitely come up with some awesome in-universe explanations for it. Right, you yeah, have fun yeah. with it. Yeah. it. Reminds me of the way that, like, the Bloodborne DLC explicitly collapses time and space into the same thing. Fantastic. Where the, the further back and the further up yeah. you go, the further back in time you are. Incredible. Yeah. I love it. So and again, it's the same, it's the same, like, you were talking about with flowing like a river, where it starts at the top and then it's yeah. literally flowing downward from there, and they liken it to, like, a a seed bed that is growing down these roots it's, yeah. uh, the old hunters i think in my opinion is the best dlc they ever did yeah Although the yeah. three crowns th- ivory king is <laughs> that map is really great that level of design um for the life of me as much as i'm praising it right now i can't remember the actual name of the ivory crown city elium lois yes elium lois that is a fantastic level yeah and that like it's not related to what we're talking about, it but terrible. it does that really cool thing. Yeah, where um, because not I mean, because it's not Dark Souls one, but it, it does that really cool thing where you cool, haha, where you go through and it's frozen. <laughs> yeah, and then you unfreeze it, and then you walk all the way back through it. But now that it's unfrozen, it's you progress completely differently, like reversing. It's really interestingly designed. And if you're good enough to kill the tiger while it's invisible, you don't have to do the level at all. Yeah. Which is awesome. Yeah. And Elium Lois also has that thing where it's pure and frozen and ice on top. And then one of the greatest single moments in any From Software game where you leap mm. through the chasm down to the, the, the chaos flame. Yeah. Uh, which is down below. Yeah. Hmm. Remember when uh, Dark Souls 3 was just coming out and we thought that the end of Dark Souls 3 would be like that. We hoped. And in- instead it was Gale, yeah. <laughs> uh. oh. <laughs> You're not a fan of the Ring City, Rich? Uh, 
Um, Three City is fucking terrible, by the way. <laughs> what a waste of an amazing idea. Yeah. Richie, could you read the next question? So, Lord of the Slumbering Way points out that the second Bell of Awakening that's guided by Quellag, if you look at the way the map's laid out, was originally accessed via New Londo. Like, it's under the backside of New Londo, mm. which is, a, like, it's a detail. Like Because I remember going down there and seeing, oh, the, the design of this area, like, it's clearly an older area that she's then built her nest yes. in. And it looks like, it looks like the architecture above. It looks like the, the elevators. But I did I had not realized before that it was connected to New Londo. So I was like, I look at it and it's like, mm, maybe. Yeah. I don't, I don't actually know offhand if it's connected. It's not, it's not quite, it's not quite that close, but it would make sense for that yeah. structure to be, I guess, from the. The architectural style is okay. like, it's not the isolith architectural style. Huh? Yes. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, Richie, next question. Princess Souls at Zero asks why the interconnectivity of Dark Souls, like, grabbed people, but I think we've covered that, if that's sort of been the thrust of the conversation. Yeah. Already. So, yeah. Um, then they ask, I'm sure I've heard about this before, but the distance between Anna Londo and the Duke's archives doesn't make much sense, because from the outside it looks far away, and then it ends up being a short walk. Did from cheat, or is my perception of distance from totally cheat? They cheat. They cheat. The skyboxes yeah. are all very cheaty. They're, everything's in the right relative yeah. position, but like proportions are exaggerated. They have you walk through that long hallway with the armored boar in it to make you feel like you're going a longer distance. But yeah, it's just it's just fudged space and also loading. Yeah. <laughs> Well, yes, and that yeah. too. Yes, absolutely. Like, people wonder why so many games have places where you have to hold uh, X to squeeze through the passage. It's like that's a loading screen that they're hiding from you. Yeah, um, I love, yeah. I, I love that the that like that Unreal uh, demo came out and everyone was watching. It's like, oh, I guess they like couldn't get rid of loading see, uh, loading crevices, and that like so, um, and that Epic had to come out and say, like, oh no, 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 we just want to show off details. Oh god, like they totally forgot that like everybody knows that's what that is, and they're like we, it really wasn't supposed to be a loading thing, we swear. I, I, actually, I actually heard someone make a good point, which is like, if theoretically we can get rid of loading we do have read speed, like you could have entirely different level design yes. ideas because yeah. you no longer need that. Like God of War, the new God of War game, the reason you have that those long boat sections through a whole lot of canyons that you suspiciously can't see out of, you can only see in a straight line, is because they're loading the next area. And like you could, <laughs> yeah. you could very much have completely new game design and like level areas if you don't need to have those mm -hmm. hidden loading screens. Crazy data read speeds may have a crazy influence on how games go. Yeah, like if you no longer need Mass Effect elevators, like yeah. you could design mm. for areas in completely different ways. That's we. I have a Bloodborne factoid about that because um, you know how like Red Grave will probably know this better than Kyan because we're both obsessive. But you know how like the path to Yaha Gul seen from a distance doesn't make any sense. Yes, we figured out that's because it used to be part of a completely different map, like in the data. It wasn't part of Cathedral Ward, and it had a segmenting loading elevator. And when they got rid of the segmenting loading elevator, they had to just really quickly, like, copy and paste it across to a different map so it would run properly. I'm vaguely familiar with it because I know that um, the, the Church of the False God was kind of slapped in there to provide an yeah. interconnected place that um, just kind of opens and shuts yeah, it's it was kind of surreal because I went into the Bloodborne map viewer and opened Yaha Gaul. And outside of it, where you don't actually go because it only considers everything past that amygdala to actually be Yaha Gaul, the rest of it it considers Cathedral Ward. But if you look at just the Yaha Gaul map, there's a ton of assets just floating in the sky mm -hmm. outside it, arranged perfectly along a series of slopes that was the original way you got so there. And they just like, it looks like they. They just grabbed those assets and just pasted them in Cathedral Ward, and that's why none of the distances line up. Yeah, so there are there are certain builds of Bloodborne, not all of them, but certain patch builds where if you 
start in central Yarnum and you traverse very quickly all the way through towards the Church of the False God, you will actually be met with a massive fog wall that blocks your progress yeah. completely. Because they and that was a way to prevent the game from crashing because they needed to load yeah. the assets in from Yahar Gol because they didn't have a convenient elevator to load it. Um, yeah, uh, I, I don't think I think if I'm I'm I want to say I'm ninety percent sure that the the most current build, if you play it on, does not have that problem. But some of them, yeah. do. no, the the um the unpatched and early patches are just like you can outrun loading yeah. very easily. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Thank you. Richie, could you read the next question? This is Princess Capitilla again. And they are asking, if you could add two new connecting paths between adjacent locations in Lordran, what areas would you connect and how would you connect them? Uh, I would connect probably Lost Easily and Tomb of the Giants. I have no idea how I yeah. would do that. My answer is similar. Uh, I would say... Because I would say Demon Ruins and Tomb of the Giants. You can see the Demon yeah, Ruins. Sure. It wouldn't be the... But yeah, those are like two things where it's like... Because it's really a bummer to go down to Tomb of the Giants and then like yeah. not be able to get anywhere from there. And I feel like just having one place you could go that was separate, especially if you end up down there early on and it was an alternative route to get down there, I think that would be pretty cool. If, if uh, there was a Great Hollow or Valley of the Drake style area connecting those two, I think it would fix... Some of my problems with the end of Dark Souls One. I, I think I was talking about how much I like the Demon Ruins. It's just a place where you fight big beefy enemies. So if there's just like oh some just, uh, just some the, ridges the you walk down, egregiously placed there for no reason. Yeah. It's See, so big, bad. Beefy, big beefy enemies I don't want in Lost Eyes. <laughs> it's so bad. I would probably do something like. Make it that if you beat the Four Kings before Sen's Fortress, that Karth would just open Sen's Fortress for you. Ooh. As, like, a means of skipping. Like, but you yeah, wouldn't have it. to do... You wouldn't have to do... You wouldn't have to do the bells, yeah. And you wouldn't have to Yeah, do I would that. just say, like, because no one is going to do that on their first attempt. So right. just be like, okay, if you're hardcore enough to beat Sif and beat the Four Kings before you've done Sen's Fortress, just say Karth does something and it opens. And you never have to deal with Frampt or the best. That would also make more sense. That would also make sense, not more sense, but that would also make sense thematically. So I, I like that. Yeah. I think that's cool. I think that's yeah. a cool idea. And then there's a second part to Capitilla's question, which is, if you could completely redesign Demon Ruins or Lost Isolith, how would you do it? Uh, In terms of, like, progression, hazards, this, charred this ring. This is the question for Kyan. I'm, I'm not going to pretend I have the experience <laughs> in game design to be able to come up with a better thing than what they did. I just know as a consumer, it's it's not a good product. I, I think we um, were talking about it on Discord last night, I think we had the same bit, thing yeah. on a practical level. Like, if I could just change something like snap my fingers, the easiest someone would just bake it so that like better chaos was easier and that just going through lost eyes is, is basically just like check and check box because it's not worth whatever but if i was to do a little bit more uh, the thing i like about because i actually like demon ruins i like being able to yeah. bully capra demons it feels That's always nice. satisfying in an rpg it's right. always satisfying when the early game boss that gave you trouble is now a regular enemy that's that, that's great I, I, I don't mind that i think that's yeah. fun that's always would, fun in any rpg i would try and continue that theme then of just having just like i guess that's kind of what they're trying to do with the big dragon butts but they're just they don't do anything okay. so i feel also, like the best thing no there. Sense that they're there yeah so i think like the best thing to do would be make some big lava ass enemies that you just fight there. Yeah. And then that's just kind of neat. It's just a neat new experience. And then just also make better chaos, not suck, whether or not you go back to the old mobile version <laughs> or you just make it that there's a bonfire at the top of the light like, boss arena. Oh, I mentioned this to you last night, Kyan, when we, cause we were just kind of talking about, uh, because we were both skimming over the outline and the bed of chaos. Now I'm not going to pretend that I am a game designer and that I know better than everyone, but I, I feel like you could so easily fix that boss fight because everybody remembers that boss fight as being a pain in the ass. They don't remember that boss fight as being a pain in the ass. What they remember as being a pain in the ass is dying to it, which you will yeah. pretty much always die to it because it's a puzzle and having to run back. 
And you could entirely fix that fight by trapping you in the boss room and making so that if you die to the bed of chaos, you start back at the top of the slide and slide back down and are in a continuous loop until you beat it. Because it's a puzzle fight. Yeah. You, don't, you don't have to worry about the player being under-leveled or under-geared. Um, because there's no level or gear or damage requirements for completing that boss fight. It fixes the run back, which is what everybody hates about the Bed of Chaos. And thematically, it even makes perfect sense, because it's an attempt to replace the bonfires and the first flame with something new. So it makes sense that it could trap you there and keep you kind of chained there until you can destroy it. No, I think that's a, a great way to just make it like, cause again, like we were saying, like, it's not a hard boss fight. It's a tedious boss fight. And there's a big difference there. It's not, it's yeah. not even, it's, like, it's like, it's, it's just the fact that you have to run back every time you die. Right. Yeah. It's, it's like uh, dragon God in demon yeah. souls, which is the same principle, but in that the arch stone is right outside. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. some people consider dragon God to be the, I think it's the weakest of the arch demons. I don't think dragon God mm -hmm. is, is particularly bad. Um, I think I think it's the worst of the arch demons, sure. But the fact that the arch stone is right there, and when you die to the dragon god, you can just go back in, makes it so much more bearable than having to to run all the way back to the bed of chaos. Yeah. Dragon god is basically as abusive as you should allow yourself to be in that situation as a designer. Like any more than dragon god, you're pushing your luck. Uh -huh. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I I if I were doing it, I would just like smudge like smush um demon ruins and lost isolate into one area mm -hmm. and just shove the golden gate like on the run up to bed of chaos like kind of like tomb of the giants yeah, right. where the golden gate is just it's basically right outside nito so just have like just get say it's one area just call it demon ruins or isolate ruins and just have like the top part is demons and the bottom part is the lava and you just go down and then there's a gold gate in front of bed of chaos where's the gold gate in tomb of the giants is it farther back than I remember? Oh, it's pretty it's, much right it's, outside uh, the Leroy. path to Nato. Is it really after Leroy? It's all... No, it's right, yeah, it's where, right after it's Leroy. Right where it's, Leroy spawns. It's all the way down. It's all the way down. You can see Ash Lake from that's, it. That's deeper than I remember. In my brain, really? it's a lot higher up. <laughs> yeah, that's but, what we were talking about yeah. last night. We were arguing about whether or not uh, Demon Ruins was a late game area. I was like... If it's not a late game area, neither is <laughs> neither is um, Tomb of the Giants. Yeah, I don't know. Whatever. Yeah, it's weird. It's weird that it's. I that guess low. my my other question that I'm just sort of now realizing is like, what if there were no gold gates? Oh, it would be a better game. Be a much better game. Too. Yeah, so much better. Uh, what does it? What do they other than forcing you to beat Ornstein and Smo at a certain point in the game? Like, what did they? It, do, it doesn't fuck up the progression if you go and beat Nito as the first boss. Yeah, you want to yeah, go for the second You want to go for a change? That right now. That's the change to Dark Souls. No yeah. gold gates. Yeah. Fact that it doesn't fuck up the progression if you beat the four kings first, because they let you do that. Yeah, yeah it makes no difference. No, the, the golden gates are a strange choice. Yeah. I guess they want you to meet Guinevere before you fight the lords, I guess, I, is the yeah. it's the, the reason behind it. I, I'm going to guess they probably yeah. had some testing where they got nervous because of some light feedback or something like that. I don't know. I couldn't tell you. Well, because, like, pretty much all the areas you can get through without fighting anything other than the bosses. Yeah. Because, like, I frequently hang out in Tomb of the Giants at the start of the game, just farming stuff and then Pinewood boning back to the surface. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, you know, the Golden Gates are not great. <laughs> yeah, although I, because I we've only got that, you absolutely should not do the Duke's archives before Anne Orlando. Yeah, right. That works out. And and the Duke's archives is completely Golden Gated off until you have the Lord Vessel. You can't go anywhere yeah. in that area. And I think that is the one of those areas that I definitely agree should not be done before Anne Orlando, but there uh, are other ways you could do that. Like a literal door. Yeah, yeah like a literal Yeah, you could door. just say, yeah. Or getting, or picking up a key yeah. uh, after you beat Orlando yeah. Smo that lets you into the Duke's yeah. archives. Yeah. Okay, uh, got a couple more questions. So, Flappy Meal 2 says that the Undead Parish is a very underrated area, Undead Burg and Undead Parish is very underrated, I think, because it's the start of the game. Everyone's just used to it. 
Uh, do you want to talk about why there are demons and wyverns and black knights everywhere in those areas? Like story wise, the demons are there because the flame is fading and it's get and the basically the light is getting weaker, and so they're crawling out of the demon ruins and going around and, and wreaking havoc. And the knights are there specifically because the demons are there. Um, right now. Yeah, because uh, like there's an explanation. It, it's just the merchant. He just says like a horrible goat demon has moved in downstairs. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's like all right, cool. No, I'm just used to this. This is what happens. <laughs> yeah, the demons are yeah. coming up because they are basically not taking advantage of because that ascribes kind of an agency to them that I'm not sure they have, but they're taking advantage of the fact that the forces of An Orlando are weakening over time. Mm. Yeah, and so the black knights are there specifically hunting the demons. Uh, the wyverns are there. They're like rats; they're just everywhere. Well, the wyverns are there because there's a panel in Berserk where yeah. a dragon coils around a thing, and Miyazaki thought. I'm trying cool. to come up with a <laughs> yeah, with an yeah. universe explanation <laughs> for it. Um, I mean, it's kind of near Valley of the Drakes. They're pests. It, yeah, it, it is. is. It is near Valley of the Drakes. Um, yeah, the one, the one fire drake that's there. Is that's there the a, mama. Is, is there a reason why it's there? Well, it flies away if you pelt it with it arrows does. for long enough. So I think it's just. I mean, what did what did drakes eat? Because I mean, it might it might just be chowing down on like undead. I don't think they need to eat. Yeah. I don't know. I can't think of a reason why that fire drake is there off the top of my head, but there's, there's, it's entirely possible there is a reason why it's there. Okay, okay, he, here's my explanation. Because it's near the Altar of Sunlight, yes. and it's one of the drakes that the nameless is king like tamed. Oh. There you go. Oh. There you go. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Oh. I came up uh, with that just you know then. What? Yeah, sure. Good job. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Go for it. Thank you. <laughs> yep, no. Thank you. That's, Thank you. I'm not even being sarcastic right now. That's, yeah, that's a good explanation for that. It's what the Good. nameless king strikes, and and it's guarding yeah. the altar of sunlight. Good job. Yeah, there we go. Bravo. But he doesn't really care because if you like do enough damage, it just flies yeah, he, away. He's right. also not particularly loyal. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Lappy Meal also asks, like, as a, an aside, why are the un? This I guess is a question toward like the whole of the game, but why are the undead in Undeadburg? trying to kill the player because isn't the idea is it's like a town of undead where they're all living together well, they're hollowed out yeah they're insane well i don't know if insane is the right word they're yeah yeah but they're hollowed out unless they mean um the merchant who was kind of hostile towards the yeah. player character no they mean the they say like attacking oh you. yeah because they're hollowed out so they they no longer have the capacity for reason yeah I like to think of them as almost like we we recorded a thing about crows uh, last week, and like there's a lot of crows around here that are fine with me because they see me every day. But then if they see another person, they go crazy and start attacking them. So I wonder if hollows are like that, where they're just like because they're stuck doing the same thing over and over again for eternity. They're like, yeah, this is how it's supposed to be. Yeah, sure. And then if something else shows up, they're like, what? Yeah, I mean, outside presences yeah. are, yeah. Uh yeah, sure I can see that. Yeah. They don't attack each other. Okay. Yeah, that's the yeah. Cool. Um. Okay. Agent Funk asks, "Do you feel the game represents the scope of the story well, or does the sort of epic scale of the story suffer because everything's interconnected and that kind of makes it like a little feel a little smaller?" I think it works out for the most part. I think right. There's and a trade off. We talked about this a little bit with Dark Souls 2. Like, Dark Souls 2 has this idea yeah. where they wanted it to be like you're crossing, you're going over an entire continent with all these different biomes and all these different areas. And uh, you kind of just have a trade off of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's like, Making yeah, you sense. did it. Right. This feels a little fake. Yeah. yeah. Versus, you know, grand adventureness. Um, yeah. I, I think it works pretty well in. I think it works pretty well in Dark Souls 1. Mm. I don't think, like, I can't think of, like, any regions 
in Dark Souls 1 that I would have liked to be grander. Yeah, I feel like Dark Souls 1, it seems small in 2020 because we've taken it apart so often and we know what the map is yeah. like. When you're first playing it, it feels incomprehensibly vast and suffocating. Totally. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah, it's like we were talking about Metroid before and like how the original Metroid is like, wow, I spent months and months and months and never made any it progress and you actually look at a map of it. Yeah. yeah, and you're like, oh, it's actually tiny. Yeah. <laughs> If I have a map, this game takes half yeah. an hour. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, which is why, like, ugh, people are like, oh, well, you should know the map. It's like, yeah, but if it had a map, it wouldn't be any good. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it's like, it's like how people can spend 500 hours on Zork. It's like, that's like a five-minute yeah. game. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, two more questions. I think we can do this. Yeah, we're good. Okay. Um, well, there's other, there's off-topic questions. Yeah, I think we can we'll skip those. those. Um, okay, so... Uh, Thomaticrat Richard asks, "What about Valley of the Drakes, though?" <laughs> uh, yeah, it's eh. it as Drakes. It's Valley. Yeah, they're in a valley. It has that. Yeah. It has that uh, great tense moment, and I, I always love when games do this, where there's an item, and you know that if you pick up that item, oh, it's yeah. not going to end. And it has just has that item nestled neatly in between the skeleton dragon's paws. And it's like, oh, I'm gonna go up there. No, but it's 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 even cooler than that because there's multiple items and some of them won't trigger the dragon. Yeah. So sure. if you happen to grab one of those, you'll think, oh, oh, okay, I guess the dragon's not alive. <laughs> you'll relax, and then the next one will spring to yeah, life and great. start vomiting on you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and our final question: Doom Kitty asks, "What is your favorite part of your least favorite area, and what is your least favorite part of your favorite area?" So, Lost Easily is my least favorite part, and I guess my favorite part of Lost Easily is the story of the witch's daughters and their brother. Yeah, and it's just kind of cool looking and everything like that. It's like it's like uh, something cool could have happened here, but it didn't. Yeah, I like the the um the Angkor Wat looking architecture. Is like you don't see that often in and like it it it's we were talking about the 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 bell tower and like you can tell like okay the bell tower is from a different place without being told because mm-hmm. the architecture of of um, Isolith is completely different to everywhere else. Right. And yeah. the least favorite part, my favorite area being the painted world, my least favorite part of the painted world is probably that it's probably the area with the bone wheel skeletons, just because whereas in the yeah. catacombs, I think they have a good arena to deal with them. In the painted world, yeah. it kind of feels like a cheap shot. Yeah, that that little area feels right. like a shit post. Yeah, well, <laughs> like the little, the little narrow hallways, it feels kind of like a cheap, cheap trap, mm-hmm. and it's just it's not yeah. great. I love Sen's fortress because I'm a monster, and it was my favorite spot to invade. But gosh, is it kind of real plain? Did you ever do the Rat Covenant? Because you seem to me like you would have loved the Rat Covenant. I did a little bit of the Rat Covenant, but this is before they kind of fixed a lot of the multiplayer stuff, so I never had a lot of luck getting people to. probably a good hundred hours just tormenting people in the Rat Covenant. Oh, it seemed real good. Dressing up in different costumes and, like, emoting down to them from up above. So much fun. Yeah, I love the concept, but I never had any luck. So much fun. So unfair. (laughs) So one sided. My only, my only, my only memorable PvP victory was a rat thing where I was pulled into the a rat player, and it was uh, Havel set with dual avalanche, <laughs> just sniping me constantly. No, and I actually just like I was in such a fucking bad mood that I actually beat them. I went all the way up the top and just threw a bunch of toxic and poison mist at them until they died. Like, so wonderful. I love how completely unfair the rat covenant is yeah how utterly yeah. and completely one-sided it is and how it's it you have yeah. a it's a nine it's a nine one matchup in favor of, shit is fun. in favor of the rat covenant and it's yeah. so hilarious to me and i love that they actually put something that blatantly unfair into the game 
Yeah. <laughs> and it's in a little, like, it's in it. You don't have to actually do that area to beat the game anyway. No, you don't. So, it's an op- it's optional. Yeah, you can head there whenever you feel like it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Cool. Okay. Oh, also, yeah. though, so then, um, least favorite area, it's like, I almost always skip the depths and upper Blight Town just because I can. Just, like, no reason yeah. to go there. But I do like that a lot of parts of the depths feel, like, real lived in. Like, if the butcher's just doing their shit and everything like that. Like, <laughs> I don't yeah, know. There's something about that I find charming. Yeah. Uh, you didn't say what your least favorite part of Sen's Fortress is, though. Oh, I would just, just, it's just, it's just kind of, you yeah, just look at it. It's just boring. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, aesthetically, aesthetic. it's boring? Yeah, and, like, this is before they really had any lighting going on. So it's, like, the lighting's yeah. not, whatever. Yeah. It's just kind of, like, real flat. <laughs> Sure. What about you, Sin? I like Under Londo a lot, but I wish there was more stuff going on there. Good answer. Yeah. Yeah. I don't like, oh, I'm having a brain freeze. Like, you could go there in the beginning and it's like in the cave and it's dark. Two of the giants? Catacombs? Two of the giants. Oh, yeah, oh, the yeah, catacombs. Dark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I don't like it and I don't like anything about it. Well, what's your favorite part of it? The favorite part is the whole game is not like that. <laughs> okay. Okay, can, my favorite part of the catacombs is, is the catacombs hammer. Is that my I don't know, I'm I'm following okay, up sure. sin. I'm like I'm like spot we 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 gradually team. morphing we're into one the same. You're like a couple. We've, like <laughs> Oh no, we, no, we've we have started day. like it's it's getting creepy. We're like starting to like finish each other's sentences and like <laughs> she'll message me with something I was about to tell her. It's it's disturbing. Um so I I think like this is not the best part, but it's like to me the most interesting part is that you need the lantern to make progress, but the lantern is also a random drop from the necromancer. <laughs> yes. Which is it's it's just it feels really king's feel it's to very me. Much like, so, yeah. Yeah, like, this is just, there's a random weird mechanic that if it happens to pay off for you, you then don't need to do something important later Yeah, there are, there are a few different ways. There's the spell, there's the sunlight maggot, and there's the lantern. Like, yeah. The only yeah, yeah, there's so many different ways to actually go down there. But alternatively, you can just memorize the yeah, path. Yeah, sure. And, yeah, 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 it's fine. Yeah. Okay, Sin. W- w- okay, Sin. Sin, say your favorite area, and I'll say my she least favorite. Said Anne Orlando. I said Anne Orlando. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Well, I guess it's the same as what you were saying. With like, it feels sparse in- internally because, I mean, I kind of get it because it's meant to be abandoned and empty. But they they set it up for a long time, and you go there, and it's like, oh, the, I guess Guinevere just like slept in this largely empty room somewhere. <laughs> She was a minimalist. The painting of herself. And there's like two rooms with human sized beds. And that's it. Yeah, and it's like, I, this is where the gods live. <laughs> and there's one that has like a couple benches and a painting. Yeah. Of yeah. some concept art. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, this is the Always throne of the gods. Sense. It's like, really? <laughs> well, actually, you know what? This is actually like real life. So basically, the gods built this entire castle and the city and whatever, and they had no money left for furniture or decorator. Yeah, they did though. It's just tacky and doesn't work for them. <laughs> like they, like they, they, like there's a bunch of human sized doors in An Orlando. <laughs> it's like why? Like what? Like sure, I guess the knights need to travel through, but like if this was your house, you would you'd think that all the buildings would be accessible by the gods. <laughs> Yeah, what did they do there? Like, like yeah, it's it, it's the polar opposite of Boletaria, which is like <laughs> perfectly yeah. designed and lived in. Yeah, because Anolando is just like a bunch of copy pasted rooms. One of them is a kitchen yeah. <laughs> that makes it feel lived in, and there's a secret passage to um, some mimics. And there's like the the chapel in Anolando, which I guess is the gods' chapel to themselves. <laughs> And none of the painting guardians are facing the painting. <laughs> They're not allowed to look at it. <laughs> That's literally their only purpose. <laughs> you could hook the painting and take it up through the rafters and run away with it, and they wouldn't know. <laughs> have you guys seen Zoolander? Yes, I have. <laughs> <laughs> That was a discussion of Dark Souls Map 
design relative to other From Software games and also in and of itself our special guests were Kyan and Redgrave. Yay. Redgrave, if people want to find you on social media, where should they go? Uh, so the only thing I'm active on is Twitter. Uh, it's DMC underscore Redgrave. Uh, if you want to find any of the things I've done, you can pretty much just Google Redgrave Bloodborne and you'll pretty much find everything I've done. Uh, I have no plans at the moment for any content that I'm creating or, or anything new like that, but I, I'll never say never. Uh, it's certainly possible that I might make something down the line, but as of right now, I, I, I have no plans for content. Kyan, where can people find you on social media? No, you'll regret it. <laughs> you bad. Will. Don't follow me on Twitter. At K-A-Y-I-N-N-A-S-A-K-I on Twitter. Don't do it. Don't follow me. It's a mistake. Don't look up I Want to Be the Guy on YouTube. Look up Brave Earth Prologue. I don't want to talk about it. I'm so sick of my game. But look at the trailer. It looks pretty. I lo I'm proud of it, but I'm sick I'm, of I'm it. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, same. Yeah. I'm yeah. looking forward to playing it with yeah, my grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> That's the exact Damn. type of burn I need. Okay, seriously, is Brave Earth Prologue going to come out before or after Elden Ring? Oh. 